the Football Outside the Box podcast. Guys, we're all here today after a horrific, horrendous UEFA Champions League final. I'm just kidding. It was a pretty good game. How are you guys doing? What did you feel about the Champions League final? I just feel sad for you, my friend. I was really cheering for you, Christian, for your side. I wonder how you're feeling right now, man. Because you guys, you guys deserve to win the title. That's for sure. Yeah, I feel sad. So it hurts. I, I was, I was saying to a friend of mine that it doesn't hurt as much as the final day last year, obviously, because that was in our hands. Uh, this one, it felt like. You know, we were obviously the clear underdog. And I, I think that's probably why it hurts more because we played very well. I thought we played well in the first, if, especially the first half. And I think overall in the first hour, we got the start of the second half. Dortmund created um, some chances. I think even though, you know, many of us probably thought at the end of the first half, that was it. But we came out in the second half, create, you know, looked lively. Had some attacking moves, and then I think the side just ran out of gas. I think that's what ended up happening. And Real Madrid has the quality, you know, more so than Dortmund. They have better players. They were able to to capitalize on that. Yeah, good points. Good points. I feel bad for you, for your side, especially because it's been two years in a row in which you guys had the upper hand for winning both titles yeah. and you let it go. Yeah, yeah painful. Like I- painful, man. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. But back to your point about guessing out. And yeah, uh, that's what I felt like uh, was going on in much of the first half. Because uh, Borussia Dortmund was putting the pressure on Madrid. All of, I mean, for the entirety of the first half, uh, Borussia was pressing Madrid all the time and creating the chances too. And I saw an interesting stat uh, that, that the Borussia team in general, they outran Madrid by almost five kilometers. That's a lot. That's a, a very uh, considerable stat. And that's why I feel like the, the Borussia side gassed out in the second half. But uh, this game just showed me how much of a psychological game football really is. You know, When you have your chances and you miss your chances like Borussia did in the first half against a side as strong as Madrid, that plays a big toll on your confidence. You know, That fear of a big club, the fear of Madrid coming up and with a half chance in scoring a goal. I feel like the the psychology plays a big part of it and we don't pay too much attention to it because we we analyze what happens on the pitch, right? The the end product. But we don't pay too much attention to what's going on on the players' minds, you know, the the decision-making process. And I I really feel like that plays a huge toll when you play against Madrid, especially on a final. So that's why I'm a little disappointed because Borussia had yeah, they clear the chances for sure. At least oh, yeah. three clear cut chances in the first half, with Adeyemi face to face with uh, Courtois. But man, yeah, you can't let yeah. those ones slip. What do you think, Wansak? Yeah, I mean, hundred percent. I was gonna say maybe their their youth, but then I realized their team is not that young. I mean, Sabitzer is over thirty. Hummels is as as experienced as any player can be. Uh, full crew has has gone through pretty much everything in his career, uh, starting with the with the lower uh, divisions. Uh, I mean, crucially, uh, Ian Matson, one of the youngest players on the pitch, make makes the mistake to pretty much seal the game uh, at the end. But yeah, I mean, it, it really comes down to like you said, a psychological factor and and the lack of experience relatively for for Dortmund players. Uh, who who on that team has actually played in the final? Just Hummels and and Royce, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. 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 So, compared to Real Madrid, who had just won, you know, two years ago. Yeah, I mean, you know, they they're very used to winning it. I think that was that was one of the toughest things for me was seeing Ian Matson make the crucial mistake for the second goal, and you know, he played so well. Like I thought that he came into midfield a lot. He, I, w- I was actually a bit worried the more I saw him coming into midfield, but then, uh, then I saw that he was doing quite well. He was able to hold the ball, push the ball forward, you know, 
seemed quite competent in midfield, breaking some Madrid lines at times. And, you know, I was really proud of his performance. But then at the very end, just to see him make that mistake, I knew. It's, it's a very similar thing that what I saw with um, Julian Rierson, which was that he, had, I thought, had a very good performance as well. I thought he dealt with Vinicius decently well. I mean, as, as well as you can deal with Vinicius. Like, he got past him a couple times, sure. But, I mean, Vinny Jr. is always going to get past you one or two times. I thought that he and Homos together dealt with Vinny. And Ryerson was also quite positive going forward on the right-hand side with Sancho. And then what happens... Uh, he becomes a victim of this insane, ridiculous nutmeg on the touchline by Vinny Jr. And when I saw that, I was like, yeah, that's it. That's what his performance will be remembered for. So sad, so unfair sometimes. <laughs> but that's what happens when you come up against the true greats. Yeah, I saw oh, a lot you of comments. Of you. you saw the nutmeg, right? I saw the nutmeg. The that, that was a guilty nutmeg for sure. And yeah, I saw yeah, a, a lot of comments there. online saying that that nutmeg kind of shifted the whole momentum of the game. I'm not sure how I feel about that because the, during the second half, Madrid, uh, they had a clear chance with Cross and with Carvajal in the first two, three minutes of the second half. So I feel like the momentum changed during the, the, the break, you know, the, the halftime. That's when Ancelotti was able to master his, uh, his leadership skills and turn things around in the... In the dressing room, but uh, that nutmeg was really filthy. And uh, to your point, Christian, uh, both Madsen and Ryerson, they had incredible Champions League, both of them. Yeah, they incredible did. Incredible matches against uh, Atleti, uh, against uh, PSG. They were amazing. They were phenomenal. And Ryerson, he, uh, or Ryerson, I'm not sure how you spell it, but he did a fantastic job uh, marking Vinicius in the first half because Vinicius didn't have any chance. He, I think he got past Ryerson once in the first half and then twice uh, in the second. But he did a phenomenal job because uh, Vinicius is, is such a quick, explosive guy that for you to be able to attack and defend against him is such a tough job and he was able to master it. And Matson too, he was playing well. He was you know, doing, doing his job, putting up a, a good performance, not the best, but again, coming up with a silly mistake in the end. Uh, I don't blame him too much, you know, because uh, again, uh, that. It plays a huge toll in your confidence when you get scored on by Madrid after putting up so yeah. much pressure, coming up with so many chances. But yeah, man, and also another shout out to Schlotterbeck, amazing guy. He he did such a great job, oh, you know, yeah. blocking the shot. I think it was a uh, Bellingham shot in the end. Amazing block, man. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think he's he's done well all season and last season. I I, I love the guy. I I love actually a lot of Dortmund's back line. Kobel, I think, is phenomenal. Yeah. Almost who has had a resurgence. And Schlatterbeck, I think, you know, United wanted him. And I, I, they were kind of in for him when he was at Freiburg before he came um, to Dortmund. And I think that um, he's showing what he can do. I hope he stays with us for a long time. I hope a lot of them stay with us for a long time. But there's no doubt that this squad kind of needs... Um, you know, a bit of an overhaul in some sense. I think that squad building has been our issue. Um, and, you know, on, 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 on the note of squad building, you know, it, it's pretty much chalk and cheese when you compare us to a side like Real Madrid. I mean, the quality that they have is just unreal. Like, you know, Bellingham, who looks silent in the game, I think a lot of people... We're kind of making fun of that, saying how oh, he ghosted in another big game and stuff like that. I, I mean, he had a quiet game, relatively, but he's had a phenomenal campaign. And <laughs> as much as it pains me, I, I, I am extremely happy for him. Like, you know, come from Birmingham, go to Dortmund, become, you know, he grew from a, a, from a boy into a man. And he is now a European champion. I'm... I'm actually really happy for him. It's just crazy when you think about that. Out of the last 10 Champions League, Madrid won six of them, right? And at least for this one, I feel like Madrid shouldn't have won it for the for, in the first play. Because when you look at it, uh, it, this is cross last season with Madrid. Maybe Modric is too. You know, Benzema left in the start of the season. 
Uh, Courtois, Alaba, Militão, they were out for most of the season. You know, uh, players like Lunin, like, they had to they had to be brought in into the matches. Like Nacho, he played a crucial match, a role in the, the last match. But I mean, I, Madrid just shouldn't have won this Champions League, but they still, they came up with a quality and off to win the title. So what do you guys make of a team like Madrid? Is any other team going to be compared to Madrid in terms of their size, in, in terms of their importance to football, you know? 15 Champions League? That, that's insane. I have a lot to say about that, but one sec, I, I will let you go. <laughs> I, I mean, people people talk a lot about their, their black magic or, or, or their juju or, or whatever. They shouldn't have won against Liverpool two years ago, even though I'm, I'm happy they did. You know, I mean, that's just who they are. They they get to the final and and, and they win. And actually, the last time they, they lost in the final was over 50 years ago against Liverpool. But, yeah, I mean, 15 Champions Leagues, what can you say? It's Some clubs just, just have it in them. With, with Yeah, I mean, some, some people, some clubs just have it have it in them with uh, with certain competitions. And I guess, I mean, th there are things that we just cannot explain. And this is probably just one of those. I, I think that Real Madrid are just, the main characters of football. That's what I put it down to. They have to be. There's no other way. Like, I, it kind of amazes me how things seem to just work out so perfectly for them. Maybe I'm just kind of having some recency bias here talking about this season. But, you know, you look at Lunin, who all Madrid fans were saying that, you know, this guy was their hero, carrying them to the final because of his performances in the quarters and the semis. And, you know, I think everybody can agree with that. They know there's this talk of, oh, Courtois might be fit for the final. And then there's this question of, oh, what, what will Carlo do? Is he going to play Courtois, who is obviously the best keeper in the world? Or is he going to play Lunin, who maybe deserves to start the final? What happens? Lunin goes and gets the flu. So it works out in the end. They don't have to, you know upset the football gods. They can play Courtois and Lunin is going to be happy. Madrid was saying the other day, I think a couple weeks before the final, he wants to retire at Madrid. You know, Kroos, well, he obviously announced. We've seen that he wants to and has now retired at Madrid. I mean, where else do you get like a, a, a club like this where it feels like everything is just kind of working out perfectly all of their great players want to retire there. I'm sure, you know, Vinny will be saying the same thing in a few years' time. Rodrigo, there were rumors of him perhaps wanting to leave because of the imminent signing of Mbappe. What happens? He comes out a few days later and says, nope, that's all rubbish. I want to be here. Greatest club in the world. Bro, they're the main characters. <laughs> like, there's no other way around it. So Simple as that. Yep. Yeah, I mean, so speaking of that, am I the only one that doesn't see this Mbappe move working out for either parties? I mean, maybe, maybe it works out for Mbappe because he he gets his move to his, his dream club. But I don't, I don't see this working out for Real Madrid. Am I the only one? No, I can, I can explain further, but I just want to get, get everyone's thoughts. Yeah, I want to hear your explanation because I just feel like it's, it's crazy for a team who just won the Champions League to sign uh, the most promising player. You know, when City won the Champions League, who, who did they sign? They signed Mateo Kovacic. Madrid winning the Champions League, they, si they signed Kylian Mbappe. That's insane. And I feel like uh, whatever's, working, whatever's working out well for them right now, it's going to keep on working even better for them in the near future with, with Mbappe coming in. You know, they don't have a proper number nine right now. They do have uh, Jose Lu, who did a phenomenal job in the semifinals. D but he's not, you can't compare Jose Lu to Mbappe. You know, imagine playing with Vini Rodrigo on the flanks and having Mbappe as a number nine. I know he might not be as clinical as as Benzema, as CR7, or any Arcane, for example, or Holland. But I, I mean, it's Mbappe. <laughs> imagine having that Madrid side with a guy uh, as good as Mbappe. I, I feel like they're gonna come up even better next season. I, I want to hear your explanation to one sec, but I just lead in with this. 2002, 
Madrid wins their ninth Champions League. Then that summer, they sign Ronaldo, R9. And Madrid doesn't win the Champions League for another 12 years. So, I mean, if you're going off of history, maybe this is a repeat. Or maybe I'm just chatting rubbish. I would love to hear your, your thoughts. So. No, I no, mean, R- 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 before you go one sec, R- R9 is cursed. The man has never won a Champions League. <laughs> That's true too. That's true, yeah. yes. But, but I mean, was, neither has Kylian. But but the, yeah, but then maybe in five years' time we're going to be saying Mbappe is cursed because he's already lost in, in the final ones, right? I'm not denying Mbappe's qualities as a as a player. Right? He's he's obviously one of, the, if not the best player in the world currently. But sometimes, I mean, we have there is a saying. Maybe I'm just making this up, but too much is too much. It's it just seems like too much. You have Vinicius, who's won the the best player in the Champions League this season and might go on to win the Ballon d'Or this season. You have Rodrigo, who's chipped in with crucial goals and he's constantly improving. You've got Endrick coming in, who's apparently the the biggest the biggest thing since Neymar from from Brazil. And you put Mbappe into that. What Real Madrid is missing is Harry Kane. They need a striker, right? They should have, for me, they should have gone for Harry Kane because Mbappe first does not like playing striker, and second, he's just not as good playing the number nine. There's a reason why he loves playing with Giroud in, in the national team up top together because he can. He's just so much more effective with with an anchor point like Giroud and working off to the side of him. I just don't see this necessarily working. I mean, Mbappe's best position is on the left, and who plays there for Real Madrid? Vinicius at a very top level. So somebody's got to sacrifice. Are they going to play the 4-2-2-2 again with Jude and Mbappe up top? I don't think that's Jude's best position either. Jude is not going to be able to do the job that Giroud can do with France. So, I, I, I mean, maybe I'm just speaking nonsense, but I just don't see this working out for Real Madrid. I see what you mean. I see what you, you mean a- on a tactical level. Um, I, I saw something saying that the idea behind it is to sort of have Mbappe play primarily centrally and to kind of, you know, switch freely with Vinicius throughout the game. I I just have a feeling that they can make it work. Um, it could very easily, you know, not work. This is football, you know. Anything can backfire and we have a curse to talk about. Um, but I don't know. I, ju- I just think they're they're both too good, I'm talking Mbappe and Vinny, I think they're both too good for it not to be something that is extremely dangerous. I think they'll be able to switch in and out. Both of them have the capabilities to destroy teams, you know, centrally or out wide. I'm interested to see how it will work. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what to make of it tactically. Yeah, and again, uh, both of those players, they haven't reached their primes yet. Right, so we're we're still waiting for their best versions for both from both Vini and Mbappe too. Mbappe so too. Imagine what those two guys can do together, you know, maybe uh, they can step on each other's toes, right? Maybe they can be a hindrance to their own growth. But if they if they if they work well enough as a team, they can both reach their primes at the same time, which will be fantastic to see. And we also got to consider that Mbappe was a free transfer to to Madrid. They didn't pay a single penny. So would you uh, pay, I don't know, 100 mil to sign Kane or would you take Mbappe for free? I don't think that's even a question. Well, Mbappe's signing bonus is 100 mil. Yeah, signing bonus, yeah. But he came in for free. Yeah. It it all goes out of their pockets. But yeah. Yeah. They they, they will pay for him one way or another. But, you know, one thing this whole, again, this whole signing of Mbappe just reinforces the, the same idea to me that, Madrid are the main characters, and I just don't understand how, uh, unless you're from Madrid, I just don't understand how you can be in this day and age a Real Madrid fan and not be bored. Like, <laughs> like everything just works out perfectly. I saw a tweet from a Madrid fan saying, oh, um, it's actually perfect that Mbappe signed when he did, because otherwise... Um, we wouldn't have been able to 
cough up the money for um Jude and Chuameni and Kamavinga. I'm saying, my God, like imagine having those problems. Imagine having real Madrid problems. Thank God Mbappe ran down his contract for all of us so that we could afford the 200 million for the three best U23 midfielders in the world. Well, if we didn't get Mbappe to run down his contract, we couldn't have had both. But we're Real Madrid. We get to have both. It's just insane, dog. It is insane. And uh, just as an example, Chouamini was... He, he wasn't even playing for Madrid, right? He was not a bench. Kamavinga is only 20 years old. Or 19, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. Modric was on the bench, mm-hmm. too. I mean, there's so many good options. So much quality all over the pitch. And we were talking, uh, we we're talking so much about uh, Bayer Leverkusen for the past few weeks. We we're saying uh, that they had a great season, right? They only lost once in a final Europa League final to Atalanta, which was a very great match too, a great match to watch. But they only lost once, right, throughout the season. And but we're not talking about Madrid. Madrid only lost twice, wow. twice in the whole season. That's insane. They won the Champions League without losing a single match. And they only without lost Courtois. Two, without Courtois. There you go. They only lost those two matches to Atleti, so to their city rivals. That's insane. They do deserve a shout out, and I, I do agree with you, uh, Christian. They are the main character. I feel like Madrid. Uh, we all know. We all consider Madrid to be the number one team overall. I don't think there's there's even a, a debate. I feel like all the other teams, uh, like Man United, Liverpool, AC Milan. We all fight for the number two spot right now because I feel like nobody's going to ever be able to fight for the number one spot with Madrid. And that's the truth. And I just want to say, I mean, as it relates to, you know, football as a, as a, a sort of a monolith, like the, the history of football. Like, I, I was thinking about this as well. Like, if Man City was to play Madrid 10 times in a row, like over the next 10 weeks, do I think that, Madrid win the majority of those matches or City, you know? And actually, in in my mind, I kind of lean towards City just in terms of a quality um, understanding of, like, how they would match up with each other. I know, obviously, they faced each other and Real Madrid went through on penalties, right? But I just think, even though Madrid is not the necessarily the best football team in the world right now, like you said, they're just the main character. I'll t- I'm going to tell you guys one more um, tweet that I saw that kind of made me upset because it was like 24 hours after the final. But you know how Edin Terzic brought on Marco Royce and then immediately after that we conceded? I saw a tweet from a Real Madrid account saying, oh, um, Terzic bringing on Marco Royce, the, the guy thinks it's a Disney movie. And my, my response <laughs> to that was, yeah, it is a Disney movie. But... We're just not the main characters. Only the main characters get to sub on their boyhood Real Madrid fan, Jose Lu, who, in my opinion, is bang average. And he gets to score two cheap-ass goals against Manuel Neuer to send them through, and then they can say, never give up on your dreams. (laughs) Only the main characters get to do that. We all have to sit back and clap while they do that. Yes, this is the saltiness I was waiting to hear from you, Christian, because you, you've been too sane right now. And I, I want to hear more of this because... I take it, bro. <laughs> they are the main characters. Like, the Hostelu story was the one that I hated the most because the whole narrative behind that was dreams do come true. And it's like, bro, what are you talking about? If, if this was any other team any other striker he would be being slated for these tapping goals that every other striker gets slated for when there's the opportunity but no because it's madrid it's all about dreams and boyhood club get out of here i can't take them but i did congratulate them in 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 our video 48 hours after the final i have to suck that one up Painful, man. It really is. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, we also we can't forget uh, Carvajal storyline too, right? We let Eight. the smallest man on the pitch score ahead up. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. What's that? No, I mean, for me, it's just about. I mean, I, I saw this tweet 
or this this has been a discourse over over Twitter slash X um, about Mbappe joining Real Madrid. This would never happen in in especially basketball. I don't know if you guys remember, but when when Kevin Durant joined the Warriors eight years ago, everybody I mean I mean everybody was vexed that he joined a, an an invincible team. Oh yeah, Mbappe got and done the same right now. So to me, it, it's just. Football culture is, is is a little weird in a sense that we we worship the the top teams, and we bring down the do- lower teams. And I, I'm I'm also to blame for that as well. I mean, I I dish out a lot of disrespect to to the lower teams, but it, the, the culture is just it's just to me is funny sometimes. You know, we it's it's too, it can be too much sometimes. Like you said, Christian, they they worship Real Madrid. Yeah, I feel like there's a slight caveat with the KD situation, which was that. I, I, you know, I would doubt that when Kevin Durant was a child, that he was supporting the, the you know, <laughs> the Warriors or the Supersonics or whatever they were called. Um, but that's the thing. Madrid has just been around for so damn long. Lots of people have Madrid as their boyhood club. Like, I get it. And there's always going to be those narratives. You guys know how I feel already about, like, the status quo, how as soon as a team gets a good player, it's always... Well, when are they going to go to Man City or Bayern Munich or Madrid or United? You know, it, it's just how it's going to be. And that's why I feel like maybe Florentino wasn't that wasn't that far off when he suggested there should be a Super League. <laughs> maybe they should leave us all alone. Well, speaking of, so to, to end, end this topic, who's going to win the ball, don't you think? Vinicius? It's got to be Vinny. It's got to be Vinny. I mean, I even see. though Jude Bellingham, it's a great contender, I feel like it's got to be Vinny. I'm not being biased here because I, I do feel like Vinny is not the best player right now. But I do feel like he, he deserves it. He deserves it, you know. After so many seasons consistently playing well, putting up great performances in crucial matches in the Champions League, in La Liga, in the Super Classico against Barca, I feel like the guy deserves it. Let's see what he's going to come up with in Copa America, right? In a few weeks from now. But I feel like for the consistency, for the high level that has been put in uh, for most of the matches, he was also injured for a considerable amount this season. He still came up uh, with a lot of quality when he came back. Uh, I feel like he deserves it one sock, even though uh, there's a great case for Jude, Jude Bellingham too. I feel like Vinicius deserves it. I think the international tournaments will tell. I think yeah. depending on who performs there, it could be Vinny, could be Jude, could be Mbappe, and it could even be Kroos, depending on Kroos. Yeah. how Germany do. But the, the Ballon d'Or, I think we can all agree that the Ballon d'Or has gone to the dogs. And yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, it's I think not, we all, it's a popularity contest at the yeah. end of the day. It, Whoever yeah. wins Euro or Copa, it's not about it's not about individual achievements anymore. It's about yeah, and 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 you know what I think? I, there, there was a clip of Rio Ferdinand saying after Vinny scored the goal, saying how oh he won the Ballon d'Or, he sealed the Ballon d'Or. If if one goal or if one action can lead to you can be the direct cause of you winning a singular award, like an individual award, there's something wrong with that award. If that's what can happen, it has to be cumulative. And I think we just know it isn't. Yeah, that's a good point. But I don't feel like it was just for that one goal in the, in the final. I feel no, like no, it, I agree. He's been great all season, you know. But I'm saying if, if, if such fine margins can be the difference, then to me, there, there's an issue there. Because it should be able to be that his, if he's performed great all season but doesn't score the goal, and then he doesn't win the Ballon d'Or, to me, there's an issue. You know what I mean? Like, he should yeah. be able to not have one moment and still win the individual award. Yeah. But maybe sure. that's a topic for another time. <laughs> the Ballon d'Or is just a, a political award, right? Because uh, remember back in 2012 or 2013, I, I, I think I forgot the specific year, but uh, Ribéry, Frank Ribéry, he played a lot more than Messi and Ronaldo that year. And he still hadn't he hadn't won the the Ballon d'Or because the dispute was between Messi and CR7, right? So yeah, I feel like it's uh, 
we don't take into consideration what the player has put in for that specific year. You know, we put in the, the achievement, uh, whatever context is behind that specific dispute, you know, between Messi and Cristiano. So I feel like it's much more politicized than it should have been. Back to your point, Christian, I feel, I feel like it makes sense. But yeah, yeah uh, back to one Sox point, I feel like uh, we, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna see who's gonna win the Ballon d'Or after the, the international break in the, you know, a few weeks from now. It's either gonna yeah. be Vini or Jude. Depends. It all depends on how they perform. I feel like Messi also has a shout. You know, depending on how Argentina performs in the Copa America too, that would be interesting to see someone win the Ballon d'Or for the first time playing outside Europe. That would be that would be a great achievement. But that let's see, man. Let's see. I feel like Vini tops the line right now, but he has some people wanting to steal this from him. Yeah, I mean, v Vini is ridiculous, man. Like he's just an absurd player. Uh, but yeah, listen, we almost got over the line. It really is painful to have to start over <laughs> next season, but it's what we all have to do. Theo, you felt the same a couple of years ago, and you know. <laughs> So we, we, we're, we're a kindred spirit in, in, in that go. way. We're um, together, my friend. We're together. <laughs> so I guess ju just, to, just to quickly touch on some other, on some other goings on around, uh, well, in, in this case, the EPL before we go. Enzo Maresca to Chelsea, the Leicester City manager. I mean, what do you guys think about that? I'll let you go first one second. I mean... I think it's I think it's obvious what what Chelsea want. They want their own uh, Arteta two, two, Arteta two point It's just not going to work for me. The the only reason why Arteta's enjoying, I know he hasn't won anything yet, but in, enjoying this good spell is because he has the full support and the backing of of the board. And he is he, he was even uh, re, I would say rehired. He was a head coach and he got promoted to to the, to the manager, almost becoming. You know, getting more control of the, of the whole club. At Chelsea, you are just a coach, not even a head coach. You're just a coach, and do you, I mean, do you think Chelsea, the board, will will stick with him after possibly two, three seasons of eighth, seventh, fifth? No chance. Hell no. No chance. No chance. You know what Chelsea requires? They require. Yeah instantaneous success and yeah. even if you get instantaneous success you don't really have much time after that you don't have much room for error it happened with Ancelotti and it happened with Mourinho in his second spell you know Mourinho got one season <laughs> for, for failure you know but that's just how it goes I'm, I'm still surprised like that they're operating like this and you feel like, okay, maybe they're going to change their ways, but I, I just don't see it happening. You know, if Enzo Mariska doesn't hit the ground running, there's a bad feeling that he's not going to stay. I mean, to me, this Chelsea, the Chelsea board just screams like big brain moves. You know, they, they think they're above everybody. They're like, oh, we, we can dish out eight-year contracts and then, amortize the the money out over the over the eight years why hasn't nobody done this oh we're gonna sign the all the best young players in the world and try to nurture them <laughs> three minimum three players in each position why hasn't why hasn't anybody done this yet maybe mm -hmm. because it, it doesn't necessarily work so I, I just personally don't see this working out um but i mean we'll, we'll see i guess because it seems like they they have trust in them in in the manager, and and the manager know he knows what he's coming into. He knows he not he's not gonna have a say in, in what who he signs. The only thing he's gonna have a say in, in in is is the style of play, I guess. Apparently, he has one very strong one, and that's it. Yeah. What surprises me most is that they signed a five year contract with the guy. You know. Yeah. Yeah. That's the last manager, Pochettino. He lasted a season right a season with them so how in the world are you going to sign a five-year contract with yeah. a team that barely manages to let a manager stay for one season well it, well it makes sense for really? him because if they end that contract you know what i mean if they let him go he has a massive payday it it, it seems silly for chelsea yeah and 
I just, I don't know. They they seem like they're in such disarray. It's like they make Real Madrid type signings, but when we look at when Chelsea do it, it's almost like, is that really gonna work? That's so haphazard. You know, where I remember a couple seasons ago, it seemed like they had seven or eight different wingers that were like first team material, and everyone was just like, how are they gonna make that work at all? And Chelsea just seemed like a haphazard project at the moment. Yeah, it seems like they're making consecutive uh, bad decisions, right? The board, uh, back to your guys' point. You know, uh, when Chelsea gained momentum at at the end of the season, winning five in a row, they sacked Pochettino. Even though I wasn't a supporter of Pochettino in Chelsea right now, I felt like he was doing a poor job. Still, the guy, he gained momentum, and and you're going to sack him after he's doing a great job? Yeah. I don't know. I feel like they have been making bad decisions for the past seasons, you know, with uh, Graham Potter, with uh, Frank Lampard, now with Pochettino, and maybe yeah. with this Mariska guy who is, who, who's very inexperienced. He's only had uh, two uh, experiences as a manager with Parma and uh, Leicester now. He was assistant manager for uh, a few clubs, you know, Man City being one of them. So he has worked with Pat before. But I don't know, man. It's too much trust that you give to a guy that you barely know, you know, that has barely had any experience in the football world. It's being a manager of the month for me. Yeah, I don't know, man. I feel like Chelsea's in shambles right now. We're going to see how they're going to do next season. I feel like it's going to be very similar to this season, this past season right now. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I hope they continue to fumble because I love seeing Chelsea fans <laughs> get desperate. <laughs> yes, I love the haterism. Um, but anyway... So, looks like we're out of time for this week, but next week we'll be back to talk some Euros and Copa America. Sounds good. Let's go, Brazil. Let's go. <laughs> See you guys next week. That's all we have time for today. Guys, thanks for tuning in as always. We hope you enjoyed your time with us. Remember to subscribe, to leave comments, and share with your friends. Follow us on social media at FOTBPod. Don't forget to leave a review, rating, and most importantly, don't forget to turn on those notifications. Join us again next time as we discuss the highly anticipated upcoming Premier League action. Thanks again as always. See you then.